So you know me, Todd Walker. Uh, I uh, let me get my a couple things besides the domino that I need, and I usually just keep them handy. <laughs> so uh, so I don't have to be moving around a whole lot. You know, usually it's moving around because I forgot where I put it in my shop. And I'm in the middle of a project. And especially if you got glue on something and you're looking for, you know, where did I put it? Uh, makes things a little bit easier. Uh, usually I'm looking for this. <laughs> so that way I have all my tools here that go to adjust, fix, you know, whatever, that sort of thing. Anyway, uh, the first thing, we do have some earplugs if you want it. Uh, when I'm working on this, uh, depends upon what I'm cutting. It's, kind of, it's not as noisy as running necessarily, but I'm giving it, because it's going to cut the vacuum on at the same time. It's going to be that noisy. So, when I, I'm doing like uh, one project, about 200 mortises, to, you know, in a row. Uh, I usually have this on <laughs> and I'm working just, I was in the army and managed to keep my hearing in the artillery and a whole lot of other things through life and I'm trying very hard to continue to maintain my hearing. <laughs> so, so I do make uh, use of uh, these. Now every once in a while I do like everybody I say, well, it's just one. <laughs> and then you know, kind of take a shortcut. Anyway, this is the Domino uh, uh, cutter, and when I bought it, I bought it along with the uh, vacuum unit. It has a plug-in where I can actually set it, where when this comes on, the vacuum turns on. So it's got a setting for that, and you can set it also for continuous, uh, or where you actually have to press the button, you know, free settings on the vacuum. Uh, I really do like this. The reason I got it is I had a job that would just about pay for it. So it uh, came in rather handy. And it's pretty quick. But anyway, this is the basic machine. This is the 500. They also have a 700 for cutting huge uh, cannons. But let me pass these around here. This is the, on the domino, oh, the range that we can use. This is a 4 millimeter is a small one and 10 millimeter is a large one. So we can cut with this machine, uh, there's uh, several different uh, bits. Now the bits uh, in, uh, on this system are fairly easy to change. And so I'm just going to go ahead. So you pop that, pull this out, take the little wrench, loosen it up, unscrew it, put the other bit on. So uh, I was going to pass this set of bits. I wasn't going to change any bits right now. Uh, but I'll, I'll later do it during the demonstration. I'll actually use the 10 millimeter on Kumaru and show you how it does that. Okay, cut them just fine. So I'm pass that around there on the uh, bits. And after you change the bit, a little German engineering here. Now I'm back together and ready to uh, go with the next size. Uh, so if you got something where you're doing a framing, you know, like that uh, little bench over there, so that's actually done with the 10 millimeter. And each joint has two of those 10 millimeters and it's glued and then pinned, so it's going to stay together. Uh, the idea I'm trying to make some furniture that will uh, not just the wood last. 25 or 30 years like tomorrow will, though, as well as Epe, but also that the joints will survive 25 or 30 years. Uh, so that's the uh, what we're working on uh, in that particular design. That's the first one I'm working with. Now the domino comes with some different options. 
Uh, this one goes on the uh, uh, plate here uh, so that you can do different types of configurations and settings. Now on the basic machine itself it has some settings. So this is a face uh, plate. So if I'm doing a large piece that I want to put you know, uh, mortise in, I can just you know, use it this way. This has several settings though. We can do those angled mortise and tenon. Uh, it goes from 90 down to uh, 0. Now this is a setting that I usually use most of the time because I'm doing work like this. So I just set it on there and line the markup uh, where I'm actually doing the work. Uh, it's really uh, handy and useful. Now this adaption allows, you know, when you have a series, you know, like your uh, the styles on the uh, child's crib. Uh, this you can set, you know, I got, it comes in millimeters. It's a German tool, okay, so it comes in millimeters. <laughs> I learned a little math in the meantime. Uh, so you can set this from 100 all the way to 300. And that allows you to, once you have this, then these pins, and if I've got this on the right side, I can start at this end of my piece work. You'll cut the first one and then use this pin to offset it. 150 all the way down to the other end or whatever the setting is that you want. Uh, so it allows you to, to do that. Now I use those uh, to uh, do some uh, work. Now the other thing, that was about $1,200. This is, you all heard of those uh, one-time tools? This is a uh, one pair one time. This attaches to the domino, and then it has a set of uh, rails that attach together, and I can go up to uh, about four feet long. And what that allows me to do is with these stops, if you've got sometimes you they're not consistent where I would use. It's the same one, I would use this. Now, if I've got different things at different, you know, like say I'm putting together boards in this fashion here, well, where I'm going to put those, you know, might differ. If I've got some long pieces and a lot of them, then I would use this jig to do that. Now, if I just got a couple, we do like we should do on everything is your markup and setup is critical. You know, is when you line these up, okay, you mark where you want it on the two boards. You need to keep track of the face you're working from so that you don't do this, you know, or this. <laughs> or mix the boards up. You know, you got one, two, three, four, and you go one, three, two, one, you know. So there's all kinds of issues. Now, one of the other accuracy things that this does, because the one-time tools are all about accuracy and money. Yeah, this little option is 400 bucks. Uh, anyway, the idea is to actually make some stuff and sell it. But, uh, anyway, it has these uh, offsets. So the one that's on here is set up for three quarters. Okay, now this, it actually does have some American things. So three quarters, 18 millimeters, uh, 23, 30 seconds. So standard thickness uh, wood. And so what this does is eliminates me having to make the settings on this, which is for the height. Because I, uh, not that I ever, you know, get in a hurry and get ahead of myself, uh, but when you're doing something like that little bench there, it's just a small bench, but the, to do the offset, you know, for the cross piece on the legs, you know, where you got a little re recess on it, well, I'm cutting the uh, end end grain of the cross piece is at uh, 11 millimeters and then it was 18 millimeters. Well, when I set this to 11, I should cut all of the 11s, then change it to 18 and cut all the 18s. Well, I cut some 11s, then I cut some 18s, then I cut some 11s, <laughs> and then the rest of the 18s. Well, this is a very precise instrument. 
this is not a very precise instrument. <laughs> so when you're looking here to set it on the line for back to 11, you might wind up 11 and a quarter or something, you know. So what happened the first go around is when I went to assemble it, it kind of didn't sit level because it was kind of canted. Uh, and the other thing when you're holding it, it's like anything else, holding the tool firm is you want to hold it firm on the workpiece. So I found real quick that I needed to have another piece out here. So I've got enough to hold it down and hold it flat so that you give it so you don't get the angle that you're talking about, you know, and then again it doesn't fit. So that's kind of uh, an introduction on the machine machine but you know to really get in you got to use it and and play with it and everything uh but anyway i wanted to show you some things uh that i've made with it yeah we got plenty of time. so this is two of these there's no glue on this so if you want to pass this around you know take a look at it you're welcome to try to pull it apart you talking about tight fit there's no glue in there. That's just the uh, dominoes. Those are uh, the six millimeter dominoes. Uh, there's five dominoes in that. And that's it. That's all that's holding it together. You know, now, you know maybe we've got a couple former Marines out there might have a go at it. But, you know. Uh, so you're saying the trial fitting is sort of uh, out of question? No, you can do that. There's a setting on the machine that you can set it a little loose, okay, if you want to. But the reason that is so tight has to do with how long the dominoes were sitting in an unopened bag, which is like a few months. So they swelled up a little bit, so it made for a tight fit. Uh, that one over there is using the uh, 10 millimeters, you know, the little bench is using 10 millimeter uh, setting. So... Now, that I just did yesterday uh, for this demonstration. Uh, the other, th something else that I've built, uh, I've got a list over here to make sure that I have it. So uh, here's, uh, again, this, this is the, that Kumaru, okay? And it's, I consider it extremely hard wood. And uh, so, when I use a router on this, like I did on the edges, you know, the round over to get, you know, break the edge, uh, corner down so it's a nice and smooth. I use a quad bit, you know, from Freud. Found out that some of the other brands do not do so well on really hard wood. Now the Freud quad bits have done a lot of this and I still have the same uh, quad bit, but it's just the way that it works. Now I've used the one that has two blades on it. This is hard enough, it will chip. <laughs> and you get chunks flying off of the uh, router, you know. And uh, I, I thought that it'd be really neat to do a tambour uh, roll top. And you see if I could do that out of this hardwood. I've got some that's not as fit. Uh, but I, you know, I've got a tambour set for doing. And it does great, you know, on, on cedar and pine and all that kind of stuff. So I thought I'd try it on this. So I cut a board. You know, you, you take, you cut a slot, right, and then went over to uh, run it on the tambo bit, which has a little round head on the top, you know, that uh, does that. And, you know, and I have a few things to hold it in place, but I didn't have it super clamped down. Anyway, since it's cutting on both sides, this wood is so hard, it's going to catch on one side or the other and go one way or the other. I found out that you really can't do an inside route of extremely hard wood. Just, at least not with the tools that I have, uh, which is a three and a half horsepower under table mounted uh, router. So uh, I don't know. You know, you have to really get some clamping down or some does. I don't know how you would do that. But of course, then some people said, "Well, why did you want to make a tambour out of hardwood like that anyway?" <laughs> Home would be inside furniture. So, anyway, this is using the hardwood, and it's got uh, the same uh, connectors on it as the uh, bench, as the uh, 10 millimeter ones.
Now this one you can probably, yeah, it'll pry apart if you want to look at it. Uh, but it is a nice tight fit. Um, because it's surplus wood, and I didn't run it through the planer other than to clean them up a little bit, uh, so the boards aren't necessarily flat, flat, but it would be for an outdoor furniture anyway, so it's not, you know, and I can always run it through a planer again or sand it or whatever to uh, get it nice and flat. Which I want to show you this one. This you know, it's just by way of demonstration, but again, it's them and I just put some brass pins in it, and we can pull them out. But all this is, is that it's had the mortises cut in each side, and then I, at once I did, I clamped it together, and then I just drilled holes to put pins in. There's no glue. So you're welcome to look at this. Again, as you said, they, you can make them a tight fit, uh, this also has, oh yeah, Here, here's just kind of what the cut is on this end, just one, you can look at it on this end. Now on this side is two, two other cuts. This is, this is the setting to let it be wider. Not that we would ever get it where you gotta slide things around, you know, where it doesn't quite fit. Uh, so sometimes you have to do that. I've got an example why you do it a little looser. Uh, this is the tight fit, this is the looser. This one also is to see how close to the, uh, you know, I guess I got another one that's close to the edge. There it is. Yeah. So this is actually a connection. Just be careful with the pins. You don't want to cut yourself on. Did you give any consideration to uh, making pins out of the same, uh, same material? Well, I could, but the dowel making machines, we're talking about extremely hard wood. And so... Uh, if I'm going to do wood pins, I just use like oak and put some epoxy over the top so it won't be the fail point. So, is to try to make pins out of this, you know, it's going to wear out the tool and the expensive cutting tool. Uh, this gives you an example of how close I act out the tolerances on how close it can cut to the edge. On that. Uh, uh, you might have a failure point there, but it, I just was playing around just to see. I just wanted to know how close to uh, Another one that I did uh, was the Chippendale railing system. And this was a system that the job that paid for most of this machine. Didn't pay for this, but it paid for this machine. And what it was is the lady wanted a unique railing for her home. And we'd already put in a pergola on the, in the back of her yard, uh, and it's the uh, PVC sleeved over steel, uh, frame construction, uh, and then anchored to the uh, concrete pad that they had in the backyard. And uh, those of you who've been in construction know that we offset it from the house three inches so it wasn't attached. <laughs> There's some rules. <laughs> and... That was just the way around the rule, you know. Because if it's attached, all of a sudden a whole bunch of different construction rules uh, kick in. So, uh, yeah, inspectors and all that sort of stuff. So we didn't have to get an inspector. It was a standalone pergola uh, and uh, uh, prefabricated. Uh, all we had to do is the assembly. Anyway, she liked that job so well that she wanted to, her house has been put, covered over with vinyl and she and her husband had a business and they'd been extremely successful uh, and so, they, but they liked where the house was and dragged kids her down the end of the feet and all that sort of stuff. So she wanted a railing replaced on the front. They had done pressure treated three times. Uh, and one of the problems with pressure treated wood or any other kind of wood is if you pressure wash it, doesn't matter how you put it together, that water is going to get into that joint. And so it is rotted out on them three times in like ten years. So she wasn't something that was going to last. And she had searched around and had gotten with some uh, craftsmen and all that, uh, about the wood and all that. And she said, well, I really would like to do it in, with PVC. So uh, there's a few folks out there that know uh, that I would take a run at almost anything, you know, especially nobody else has done it. Uh, and I researched on the internet, nobody's done that. 
and also uh, the thing. So this is the joint that we have for the tip and depth. Real simple like that. So you got a uh, joint coming in there like that. Now, the glue, the, the tenon has, the only thing the tenon does is line it up. It has nothing to do with the strength of the joint. The strength of the joint is it's PVC. And if you have any of you work with PVC, you put that glue on, it's going to hold. I mean, it, that stuff's built for joints, you know, that are under pressure, you know, from water or any other kind of chemicals and stuff like that. So uh, it's a real good because it actually melts the metal and I mean, the plastic together. So this gives you an idea on how... I, uh, you know, when you want to do one in the middle, right? So one of the things is to get it in the middle is how do you get this lined up? Well, when I do it, I take these two pieces, this one and this one, and mark the line so that it's going to be at the same point on both of them. And so they're going to be like that. Now, there's no marking on this because I use this attachment which when attached to here slides over the workpiece and centers the cut. So I don't have to mess with it or eyeball it or try to get it lined up or anything else like that. So this will center it, okay? And it's adjustable to whatever your width is, you know. Uh, so this came in real handy. And this was just by way of demonstration, because uh, that's one of them about lining up on a lot of things, trying to make sure that it gets in center. Well, I've got an attachment that will center it, so we can pass that around. I'm going to show you something about the PVC here. And some of you may be wondering exactly what a Chippendale is, right? Well, this is the basic building block of you know, a Chippendale design. So you've got this little square here, and then it's got, this is the center, and then you've got pieces out like this. So when you're assembling it, you have to sequence your assembly. Uh, in each six-foot section, there were 54 pieces of PVC and 108 joints and 200 and something mortises. Now, the thing is, that's all I have to cut is the mortises. Because, you know, I, I get the tenons is by going over and reaching in the bag, and then, you know, that's how I make tenons. I can reach in the bag. Uh, it's just the mortises. So there's two mortises, these uh, uh, tenon uh, joint. So that's the basic in it. This is another, this is a, a piece of the, of the railing. Uh, it would actually be. She wanted it this way, so this is angled like this, okay? So that's kind of what her railing looked like. Now, the thing, like I said, this thing paid a better part of the cost of that machine because with my time and labor and everything else involved, this type of railing, of course, there were some fancy plastic sleeve steel railings on top and then the and bottom one and then columns into it. Anyway, it works out to be about $100 per linear foot is the, uh, what, what she got charged. So, uh, it's, uh, but nobody else has got one. And, and we made a deal. She says, well, you can build this for other people. The Chippendale design, not that sort of people. As long as you don't put one in my neighborhood. <laughs> so she's going to make sure she had the only one in that subdivision, and she did. She had the only one in the subdivision. Now, one of the things, uh, if, if you have a desire to work with PVC, cutting the mortises is not that big a deal. It's mostly about lining them up. Um, I think one of these... When uh, one of the things that I did, you see the little blue tag, that blue tag, that was how I figured out I needed to make sure I kept track 
of what was up and what was down and all that kind of stuff. Because I had a piece like this, but I had gotten it this way. Because it's the same distance, it'll fit either way. But because this is centered in here, but it may or may, it may be a little off as far as centered this way. You know, you, I set it up to be close to center, uh, but it wasn't necessarily. When you flipped it, you could feel a little ridge. So I have some samples now. <laughs> Because uh, I kind of flipped the board and the assembly, you know, that after uh, doing that, then I figured out real quick that I needed to have some methodology for keeping up with where I was. And then, of course, the assembly is a little trick because you got to start here, and then you do this board, and then you build this unit, and then you have all of these here, so that when this piece here... Uh, when we got ready to put this piece on, you notice there's some force moves in another section like this on the other side. So, for example, on this one, here's one, two, three, four PVC joints that have to be glued simultaneously. So, you question about pre-fit? Yeah, I pre-fit this thing three or four times on, on anything more than a single joint. To make sure that it fits, that everything's lined up, there weren't any, you know, skips and everything else like that. And then you put your, you know, you get your tenons in there, and then you got. Uh, actually, I put the tenons in this piece here, okay. But this one is cut tight. You know, it has a tight setting. You know, so there'll be one, in, and that's basically my guide one. So it's cut real tight. All the rest of these are loose. <laughs> so if something's a little off or I didn't quite get it where it should have been and all that, I had room to play with. So all the things I had concentrated is where my mark was, because like I said, it's my eyes is the precision problem. You know, so when you draw the, uh, uh, the line here where this is going to be, you know, because it's on this piece here, let me do this. So if you've got a line drawn across here where this is going to be, well, this is the one that you're going to be off. This one, I've got a tool that gets it centered. This one, it may not be right on the line where it should be. So I made those all loose except for the center one. I just made real sure this one was dead on. And so uh, then when you uh, blew it up, so I would have it set up on my uh, work table. And uh, so I've got this here up against something, got all the glue, and then when you put it, uh, you know, I would actually have put it and clamp down this way. So this piece here, and then I set it on the end of the tenons, because I've got it glued here, and then I set it on the end of the tenons to make sure everything's right, and then grab my adjustment tool, and bam, bam, bam. <laughs> <laughs> very quick, you know, so you have about a second and a half you know, because once it touches, that's pretty much where it's going to be. There's no undoing it like we would, and, you know, tight bond glue, you know, you can pull around that five, ten minutes, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But PVC, you definitely have to cut everything right and make sure it lines up and take it three or four times before you glue it up. Uh, but like I said, it was well worth it, and I really haven't heard of anybody else building a Pippendale railing system with PVC. Did you find that there was any problems with uh, thickness, consistency? You know, all the you know, they're they're pretty good, but since I'm keying off the same side, you know, on, on one side it's all flat. I mean, you, you can see feel a couple places are like these are nice and flush on both sides. Uh, yeah, this one's just just a hair off. I can feel the difference, but you really can't see the difference. You know, that sort of thing. So. But no, as far as consistency, it's pretty good. Uh, now, I, I would buy everything at once so that I'm, you know, assured that I have the same lot. You know, there's things like that that can have an effect on it. Or, you know, you can't go to, say, buy half of it at Home Depot and buy half of it at Lowe's and, and expect it to have consistency because they use different manufacturers on something. Uh, so, but, it, you know, I just... Buy what I need, you know, with a little extra. And, uh, unfortunately, you see, it's a good thing I got some extra. 
it turned out I needed it. Uh, Yes, when you're done, these are all the same. But like I say, with the domino, I was able to do that, you know, because I had the pin and it's dead on accurate as far as the distances. And everything. So I'm using 100 millimeters from here to the center. Yeah, so, and then like I say, you do your assembly, you have to figure it out. And I had a little, you know, sheet, you know, do this first, this first, you know, like that on how we're going to do it. I do, but I didn't bring it with me. Good question. Yes, sir. Would you say that uh, uh, fish tool, I, I really bought the deep and look at fish tool because of the price, but would you say that fish tool is worth the dollars that you pay for it? If you have reason, I mean, I, I've got some things I got just because I wanted to try it, you know, just I wanted to know, you know, but most all of that is under $200. <laughs> Did that, that kit that you have there, all those pieces, did that all come as one kit, or did you have this is out? This is one kit. The whole, well, I mean, all those little pieces that you... Uh, oh, this all, kit. yes, this all comes with the domino. That all comes with the domino. Yeah, all that comes with the domino. Uh, this, uh, this is like so many things, you know, from them are expensive from Woodpecker, you know, they're one, one time tool. Yeah, and I know it's a marketing thing and everything, but... Uh, you know, just like Rick and I talked about, you know, putting together boards. It comes in handy <laughs> to have this, you know, when you got some long boards and you want to, you know, it's like uh, taking a bunch of uh, boards to build a bench like this. But with a domino, I could actually assemble a bench like this. And I may do that and make it out of Kumaru. So you'll be able to beat on that with a hammer until <laughs> come off. And it'll be just fine. Huh? You're gonna need a crane to lift the off. Well, when I built my workshop, I built it with the idea that I could put a, a uh, big lathe in it and also anything else. It's a 12 by 24, uh, but the center beam is uh, three 2 by 12s laminated together. And then the uh, exterior walls, of course, are on a poured uh, foundation and then block on top of that. Uh, or, uh, kind of crawl space kind of, and I poured all of those, uh, put the foundation is 16 by 16 uh, all the way around with block, and then the house, the building is actually attached with bolts, you know, 5 8 inch bolts attached to the base. So, of course, when the inspector came by, he says, they a house in the county built this well. And he was amazed that the corners were square. And, <laughs> I said, it's my shop. Why would it not be square? You know, he, says, he says, there's hardly a house in Gwinnett County that's been built in the last 20 years. It's square. And I found that out when I did some work on some houses and I go to put crown molding up and find out that the corner is 92 degrees or 88 and a half degrees in the corner. You know, there, there are no 90 degrees, you know, in it, which flat makes flat crown molding a little more complicated. <laughs> there is no such thing as a flat wall. That's true. So, with that, any questions? And we'll go ahead. We have time to demonstrate. I was going to ask if you could. Yes. Uh, what we're going to do, let's see which bit I have here. Uh, how about we go ahead and what we'll do first is uh, I'm going to do a probably the, the biggest one. This is the uh, setting for the depth, and since we're going to be doing the these, okay, which are uh, 50s, so we'll just set this from 20 down to 25 as far as the depth. And like I said, they have several different sizes from 4 millimeter to uh, 10 millimeter. So we're going to put the 10.
We're going to put the 10 millimeter on here and we're going to cut Kimara. What's the 10 millimeter cost? Uh, they all run a, about a bag, but there's different amounts in each bag. Uh, let's see, I just bought some here. I think it's $20 for a bag. Now these are the ones you use for outdoors. So these are the uh, 10 by 50s, and there's 85 of them, and they cost $44. So that's about 50 cents a piece. We'll just do another three-piece flat here. And uh, I have a little more space in my shop than this, but not much, so I'm kind of used to stepping over stuff. Make sure this is tight. It, how it works is similar to a biscuit corner. So as we said, making sure you know what you're doing while you line it all up. Move this out of the way for a minute. We're just going to uh, come down from the end. Uh, I've got a pin on that, and so I'm just going to mark the center on these. So we'll do uh, three. And what I'm using is these uh, here. You know, when you push against the board, they'll go in. But I can also use them as a stop from the ends. And they're the same. So I'm going to use one stop on the left side and the other stop on the right side. And I'm going to cut one in the middle. <coughs> and we're going to cut them all tight. You see just how well it works out. It should fit. Now, when I'm working with pine, obviously I do it a little quicker. <laughs> Don't flip them the wrong way. Okay, so this will be this way. So we'll just go ahead and put these together.
and persuasion. Like I said, this this wood it hasn't been four squared or anything. It was just taken off of the uh, uh, and just run through the planer enough to just get uh, what it looks like on top. So that's it, and that's in one of the hardest woods, and the mortise is just you know go a lot a lot quicker. And uh, with accuracy, now I can you know, mess them up like anything else, but uh, now one of the things uh, that this was uh, what I can do is um, uh, styles, you know, which uh, would be like this. Okay. So it's the same thing, it's just you're, you're taking the board now, if I was doing the uh, pitch rib, you know, we would set it up and then just have it, you know, keyed or marked however different ways you want to do that. Uh, set up as uh, what's here, but mostly when I'm working my set, this is about, I've got something to hold it in place, so I'm pushing against it, and this is plenty enough to hold it in place, because if I push harder than that to move this, then I'm probably pushing too hard on the tool, you know. But the uh, hardwood, that's probably the most difficult uh, stuff to uh, drill. Uh, but it, the, the bits are very, very good. Uh, they uh, hold up. I haven't replaced any yet. And I've done a fair amount of hardwoods and everything. So I'm very uh, well pleased. Now, some of the things, uh, something else that I did with this, this kind of is a, a larger scale. but. I turned the chess set for my son. I think some of you saw that chess set. And I also made a chess board for it. And it was out of bird's eye maple and Honduran rosewood. So, you know, for scale purposes here on the camera. So when I did the, uh, the board for the chess board, <clears throat> you know, you do that just like you do for the uh, cutting board where you take out and cut them all the same and then you put them together and then you cut them and then flip them and all that sort of stuff. But the thing is, that as I assembled it, I actually used the uh, tenons, you know, because I've got two different woods, Honduran uh, rosewood and bird's eye maple, and they're going different ways as far as the grain and all that, so I was worried about it uh, splitting and spreading out and doing all kinds of things. And uh, so it was uh, three quarter inch thick, uh, wood, and I actually used tenons uh, to go along the uh, boards lengthwise when I had it. Now you have to get your accuracy on where they are, because when you cut this way, you don't want to have an exposed tenon. And so a lot of it had to do with making sure the measurements, and then when I got to the end when I was cutting them off, I did hit tenons, but I hid that in the middle, because I didn't calculate fully the curve, accumulated curve width when you're running eight cuts. So by the time I got to the end, it's like an inch. <laughs> and so, you know, I said, well, okay, I can put that piece in the middle. <laughs> uh, but so in essence, on the chessboard, uh, there is now a tenon this way, and then a tenon here, and a tenon here, and a tenon here. So it's Every square, except for the end ones, has four tenons. And the end ones have three, and then the corners have two tenons. And then it has a nice, you know, trim piece around the outside and everything else like that. So I've used it to, you know, build a chessboard, uh, built uh, benches, and, uh, you know, so there's not much you can't do that I am, and I would, I'm a novice as far as any kind of, you know, fancy mortise and tenon work. I haven't done a whole lot. Uh, you know, I was like most do-it-self folks, you know, uh, once we found out about trade screws. <laughs> Didn't do a whole lot of mortise and tenon for a long time. But then, you know, with the mortise and tenon, you do have a much 
stronger connection and a much better connection and it just looks a lot better and you can do different things and all that but uh, some of you know far more about that uh, than I do. Uh, I think that's about everything. I have some sample pieces up here and we can change a bit and, and you know cut on some uh, uh, pine or we can cut on some others you know after the uh, meeting I'll be happy to stay around and uh, one on one or three on one, whatever, you know, how, however many of y'all are interested, uh, and we can talk about this, and Rick said he'll say about the others. And, uh, yes, sir. We well, pass those bits around, they look like milling, milling bits, but how do you get a round bit to make an oval hole like that? What, what's the action of that bit in that tool? The bit rotates and oscillates. Mm -hmm. And, uh, because it's some amazing engineering. <laughs> yeah. I'm truly impressed. Uh, uh, when they first came out and I saw how much they cost, I said, there's no way in heck I'd ever own one of them. dying to have one. <laughs> question, just a general question. Anybody ever use that beadlock system, you know, where you drill three overlap? I had a similar system a long time ago. Yeah. It worked good. And then they have a similar loose handling. Yeah. But Rock goes and has one, I believe. Yeah, it's, it, that gives you a similar con, uh, connection to this. That's a whole lot cheaper, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> but again, you have to have it where you set up your jig for your drill press so that you get it, you know, in the right place and you have to take the work to the drill press. Uh, so I've tried to do it without. Not so good. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, you're you, side side. It, it's up to you to hold it down, but it's just a matter of holding it down. Okay, because it, when, it's, when it's doing that side to side cut, you know, like my head's telling me that. Uh, well, yeah, it, I found doing the hardwoods, yeah. not, not so much on pine and maple and all that, but especially these, these extremely hardwoods. Yeah. Uh, if I get aggressive and try to go too fast, it will move the machine on me. So you just slow down, like so many things, you know. Uh, you know, while, like on the router table, I get in a hurry. And so the same thing I, when I'm routing this stuff, I'm going a lot slower than I am with pine. Uh, but it, 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 even with a quad bit, if you get ahead of yourself, it'll chip and break out. Any other questions? How often do you have to empty out your dust collector? Uh, not too often. It's, it's, if you think about it, it's not that much sawdust. You know, we just got a little, even for the uh, tin, it's only, uh, you know, 10 millimeters, you know, uh, that, you know, just going in uh, 25 millimeters deep. So it's not that much sawdust. It pulls it all out, though. You saw there's no dust. No, it's got a uh, HEPA filter. Filtrated at two filter levels uh, involved uh, with it. So I uh, like it. They also have this same system for those of you who know about seat rod guys. They have a sander on a pole that hooks up to this, and you can actually sand in a house, and you don't have to have all that ventilation and all that, and clean up a snap. Now, that's an expensive sander. But they do have one on on the pole and with the hose, uh, extended hose that goes in. So uh, they've done. Uh, it's not just in the woodworking shop. They've also got some a lot of commercial tools out there also. One final comment: If you're doing traditional mortise and tendons, I didn't hear anybody say this. You always cut your mortise first. Yes. Yeah. And you cut your tendon with that. Get your tendon. Yeah. 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 Was that it?